I'm not a bad knitter, but I didn't swatch. Bug Crafts episode 89. What's up everybody? My name is Amanda, but you may know me on the internet as Mando Bug, and this is my channel here on YouTube where I share the things that I am making. This week I have knitting, crochet, spinning, and polymer clay. No sewing, not this week. So starting the shot with something I've learned. Oh yeah, resin. I guess I kind of lumped that in with polymer clay. Something I've learned is how to make resin buttons. So I made an order with Miniature Sweet, and I think I talked about them either an episode or two or two or ago. <laughs> and um, they're over in Hong Kong, and I bought a button mold and some more UV resin and um, a, like a little sampler pack of glitters and. Um, powders and little confettis to put in the resin and I played with the molds. So I'm going to give you a change the camera here and give you a better view of what I made so you can because they're so small. <laughs> I want to be able to show you up close so let me fix that for you. So I have a wide variety of buttons here that I made using that mold. These two buttons are the same these two are the same, and these two are the same. These ones are not the same. I made them, oh, and you can't even see these two. All of these little ones are all different. So I used two molds that were next to each other to make these sparkly blue buttons, but they turned out to be two different molds. Same with the green ones, same with the red ones, and same with the pearl ones. But the ones that are the same, I made the button, popped it out of the mold, and then made another button. So the gold ones, um, this is just clear UV resin with some s gold sparkle that has been added to the resin to make a sparkle button. And when you pour the resin in, depending on how you fill the mold, um, what happens is if you don't fill the mold all the way, you'll get this rough edge and then it will also stick to the holes. And so then you have to sand that down. So this button has been sanded. This button has not yet been sanded. So you can see it's a little thicker. It's got rough edges and the button holes are a little bit, um, protr they protrude a little bit. So uh, that did happen. On the big one, um, I focused on working on this button first. It's got some bubbles in it. I didn't know that you're supposed to use heat to try to remove those before you cure the resin. Also, I put these confetti in um, on the first layer, and I wish I had put them on the last because I don't like how much, um, how they look so close up to the front. But I sanded it down on the front and it made it frosty looking. And so then I put another glaze over the top with a paintbrush that made it really streaky. Uh, I think I just cured it too soon instead of letting the resin sit. Um, but it is a cute button. And then this one is the same button mold. It's clear resin again with bubbles because this was before I learned about using the heat source to remove the bubbles. Um, but it has not been sanded and you can see I over poured this mold so there's like sharp edges that just need to be sanded down. The button hole areas just need to be sanded down. So I just used some more clear resin with glitter to make these other buttons. I just wanted to play with the different shapes and sized molds and the different glitters to see what kind of buttons I get. I really like the blue one and the red one. The green one, not as much. And uh, I really don't like how small these buttons are. I'm not really sure what I would use them for, but maybe I'll find a purpose down the road. But the glitter buttons have been a lot of fun. None of these have been sanded yet. They all need to have the edges sanded down. And then here are the two little pearlescent buttons that also need to be sanded down. And uh, that is just a powder that came. I guess it can also be used for nail art, but it works in the UV resin as well. I also made a handful of coffee bean stitch markers. And I'm really happy with the way these turned out. Um, I used a real coffee bean for reference and then just kind of did my best to replicate it. Um, I tried to texture and shade it. The shading looked better before baking. The After baking it kind of made the entire bean look 
uh, all the same color, but the clay was actually brown and I shaded it with black. So I have been playing with a couple of these, just kind of giving them a test, giving them a feel. Um, I actually sold a couple on Instagram. I wasn't planning on selling them right away. I'm thinking about opening up shop to sell some stitch markers because I'm having so much fun. Um, but I'm still definitely in the testing phase. If you're interested in testing these stitch markers, send me a message and I will send you some stitch markers and you can fill out a product questionnaire <laughs> to help me make um, better stitch markers. But um, I made all of these with a, just a 10 millimeter ring, split ring, and then I actually got some lever back earrings to test them as progress keepers as well. I also made some Pokeball stitch markers, which I sent some to Kat, and then I kept some, um, just like the ones that didn't turn out so good, like that have the UV drip. I, I did a UV glaze on these, uh, UV resin glaze on these, and didn't catch the drips on some before they fully cured. In Washington, we don't have the best UV rays in the winter. It's very overcast and rainy and dark. So this one's actually not that bad. But, uh, so it, t it takes like almost two days for these to cure, which is a lot longer than it should take. But um, these feel a little heavy and they're actually kind of large, so I don't know how good they actually are for stitch markers. I just wanted to send some to Kat and uh, I was just kind of testing out, you know, making different sculpts and different sizes and just kind of playing and having fun. And then I got some miniature cookie cutters in and I decided to have fun with some Valentine's themed cookies. <laughs> and so this is just a little sugar cookie that I sculpted and put like a little icing on and a little confetti heart and I only put the UV glaze on the frosting and I did that for all of these little guys just the UV glaze for uh on the frosting just because the UV get glaze will make everything shiny I didn't want to make the cookie shiny I think I might try to glaze some of them just to see what they look like after becoming shiny um and I have heard that the UV resin will uh, kind of remove some of that nat that texturing you put in so it will be less textured um, but I, another option would be to, to glaze this with polyurethane but again that's going to make it shiny as well uh, that's what I glazed the coffee beans with so uh, but coffee beans are naturally just a little shiny sugar cookies are not so I'm conflicted but like I said I might experiment and do one or two just to see what happens but um, I made some of these heart ones with glitter on them. This one has glitter, this one doesn't, um, but I gave one away. So I'm just kind of experimenting and having fun. It's been a lot of fun. These are uh, de they're, uh, textured and then also shaded. And I think the shading shows up better. This was like a really light beige color and then I shaded it with like a yellowish, brownish, orangish color in that. Uh, didn't blend as much as the black on brown did so that was interesting but yeah that's what I've been doing as far as clay and resin and stitch markers and buttons all right so I also finished Emily's uh, tube socks that I was working on so these were the free pattern by Jane Richman for kids tube socks and I did 36 stitch socks again because this Blue Moon Fiber Arts Super Sparkle sock yarn is thicker than the trekking yarn that I was knitting with and I thought they would end up a little larger but they didn't actually end up that much larger so I should have I should have gone up to 40 stitch socks and I will do that on the next pair they fit but it's not easy for her to get them on and off so um, I hope she gets a decent amount of wear out of these. They're beautiful and I love that sparkle in these super sparkle socks and just the bright fun colors. She likes them so um, I'm happy to have knit these for her. Um, oh and I did, this time I did a twisted rib on the cuff and I just think it makes a nice, a nicer looking rib in my opinion. My just plain knit one pearl one ribs have a tendency to 
not be as stretchy yet, just the way I knit, I guess. But the twisted rib, it stands out more. Let me show you up close again. I didn't get that close. It, I feel like it stands out more and it also is um, gathers more after you stretch it, gathers back in. So I think I'm going to keep doing the twisted ribs on socks until I get tired of it or want to try something else. I was actually going to do a longer cuff on her sock, but I tried them on her and realized I don't want them to be too long, especially if she's going to outgrow them in width sooner rather than later. So I decided to just stop at just, I think I did just maybe a dozen rows, if that. So um, I knit these on US size zeros. Um, yeah. So what else did I finish? Oh, some hand spun. So I don't remember if I'd showed you guys that I had picked up this fiber, but this is the final spin for my hand spun soon to be half moon oracle shawl. So this is Shopple's in silk roving and it's a really nice uh, merino silk blend. It's a 75-25 blend and this one was really fun because the roving was mostly off-white with streaks of gray in it. So when it spun up, it spun up really, um, you know, let me move my light. I think my light's bugging me. I don't like where it is. Uh, hopefully this will be better. <laughs> okay. It uh, looks much better. So, uh, yes. This is still a little bit wet because it takes forever for things to dry here in the winter. And um, it is a little overspun. I think you might be able to see that in some areas. This is a fold single. So I did do my best to felt it a little bit just to keep those fibers intact because they are, well, in this case, overspun. They shouldn't have been overspun. I guess I got happy feet. I don't know if you guys have ever gotten happy feet on <laughs> your spinning wheel, but uh, what I mean by that is your feet go faster than your hands. And uh, sometimes I find that happens if I'm feeling stressed or um, anxious to finish the spin. So, um, yeah, just a little overspun. I find that when I want to put less spin in things and prevent myself from getting happy feet, I will tighten up that tension so that my take up is um, stronger on the wheel. So you know how when you're setting your tension, you want it so that your wheel's not ripping the fiber out of your hands, um, so that you're feeding it in as you're ready. But I find if you have your tensions. If I have my tension set at that take up, then I easily overspin my singles. So when every now and then as I spin, I'll let the fiber ply back on itself um, so that you can see how much twist is in your single. Because like on these, you can't, your eyes can't see the twist, or at least my eyes can't see the twist. Uh, maybe on this fiber more than others because it does kind of have that, um, those gray streaks in it, you can kind of see the twist by following those but on a solid fiber you can't see the twist but if you let it ply back up on itself you can see how much twist is in that and kind of gauge how much twist is in your fiber based on checking your single when it plies back up on itself so I was um, so periodically I'll do that I obviously didn't do that with this spin but uh, when I do that and I see that I'm over spinning my singles, I will tighten up that intake so that I feel the wheel pulling the yarn for me and that kind of like reminds me, slow your feet down, slow your feet down. So anyways, that's something I do. I don't know if anyone else does anything like that. Do you guys have tricks for uh, making sure you don't over spin your singles? Um, each of these skeins was 50 grams and they're not the same weight and they're not even fingering weight which is what I was shooting for uh, but I didn't use a control card so that's what I get. Um, <laughs> one is 168 yards and the other one's 138 yards which is fine. I'm going to be knitting a shawl with it so it's not going to hurt anything. So um, I was going to show you my colors. Actually I have the pattern printed out too. I don't. I'll get into when I'm going to cast it on, I think, in a minute. So this is the Half Moon Oracle Shawl um, from Kristen, who has a and Vine Yarns and the Yarngasm podcast. It's a beautiful three-color shawl with lace and brioche, and here are my colors. I think, I think I went the right direction. Let me... 
I spun this one first. Got this gorgeous red bamboo uh, wool blend at Vogue Knitting Live in Seattle. And then this was the third color that I picked up that's the same base as this uh, dark navy blue. So I don't know if the, yeah, there we go. So I have my light set up in the perfect spot. I need to write this down so I don't forget. But this is showing up very true to color on my camera. A very deep, deep navy, a very deep, deep maroon that's got a lot of like black um, depth to it. And then this off white with the gray um, striping throughout. So I think these three colors are going to make an amazing Half Moon Oracle shawl. My only concern is that these colors are so dark that I might not get much contrast between them with how high contrast this is to them. But I do love all three colors together. Maybe I'll just have to make sure, I'll have to look through the pattern and see if there's any way I can keep these two colors from being next to each other. So yes, soon to be Half Moon or Shawl. That's what I was going to say about um, casting on. So, I was doing Operation Whip Down at the end of the year and my enthusiasm has slowed. I did get some rather large projects off my needles and hooks, uh, this being one of them, which is so cozy and warm. I haven't woven in all the ends yet still, but I keep wearing it. Uh, my goal is to finish them by today. And now that I've said it, hopefully that can count as some sort of um, motivator, like, oh, I said I was going to on the podcast, so now I have to. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, yes. I've set this rule for myself now that uh, because I don't feel like working on any of my old whips and I feel like casting on all the new things that I should probably set some sort of restrictions to keep myself from getting out of control with the whips. So I've decided that um, I'm not going to cast on any more projects that are in the same product type as what I already have on the needles. For example, I have three shawls on the needles. I'm not going to cast on any more shawls until those three shawls are finished. That is why I'm not casting on my Half Moon Oracle shawl yet. Because why should I start a new shawl when I haven't finished the three that I've already started? And if I really don't want to finish them, I should really just frog them. And so I'm forcing myself to make that decision. I don't want to frog the shawls that I've started, so I just need to finish them before I start any new ones. Um, same with blankets. I've got, still got two blankets going, so I'm not going to start any more blankets. But I have cast on other projects today using that reasoning that, oh, I didn't cast them on today, but since last recording, um, using the reasoning that I don't have any projects like them on the needles, so that was my justification. <laughs> Plus, it's always fun to have something new. So um, that's pretty much it for all of my finished objects. I do have one uh, reverse finished object, if you can call it that. I frogged my sweater, the Staring at Stars cardigan. I did after I finished recording. I took it out, and I have to say, it was not as easy as I expected it to be. I, I've heard uh, other people talk about frogging sweaters on their podcasts, and you know, they just kind of mention it, oh yeah, I frogged it, or, you know, repurpose the yarn. But I guess I had never seen anyone really go into detail about what it is actually like. And because I alternated skeins, it was harder than I thought. So here is my reclaimed yarn. So four skeins. No, it did not come out like this. I got like eight or nine small balls of fiber. I actually lost a lot of fiber in the process as well because uh, when you weave in your ends, you you lose that part of the fiber. It Like, at least I did. Uh, when I went to unravel, you know, you've sewn your end in over the top of your knitting. You can't just unravel that part if you sewed it in as well as I did. So I had to actually cut those sections and I lost some yarn. And also, I lost... Um, I don't know if it was from wearing it. I only wore it like three times. Um, but in some areas, the plies broke. So I lost some yarn to broken plies as well. And um, 
yeah so I knotted a bunch of the small balls together when I after I frogged them so I frogged them had all these balls and then I weighed them roughly to see you know groups of roughly 100 grams and then I wound them onto my nitty knotty because they were like you know crazy zigzaggy curly yarn wound them onto my nitty knotty tying the small balls together so I don't see I don't see any of the ties in here but there are knots each of these is about two or three small balls and uh, I figured when I go to re-knit this yarn I'm just going to when I come across a knot I'm just gonna cut and have an extra end to weave in and I feel like um, having bigger skeins to wash because I had to relax the yarn obviously it's not curly anymore I wound them into skeins and then I washed them in some lukewarm water with a little bit of eucalyptus wool wash and which the wool wash was may or may not have been necessary because I only wore it three times but why not it makes it smell amazing but I got so I got them to relax by doing that so I think it was easier to wash them in the whole hanks and then also I feel like it's easier to store them in four hanks versus like well, I guess if there's four and there's about three balls in each, that's like a dozen balls um, versus a dozen small balls. Um, so that is why I chose to do this. Um, and because, like I said, because I knit it uh, striping, I, I striped, I alternated skeins every other row on the sleeves and every two rows on the body because the sleeves were in the round and the body was flat. Um, it was annoying to unravel because I would have to do one ball and then the other and then the other and then the other so it took longer than I expected as well so I did kind of want to mention that um, if you've never frogged a sweater now you kind of know what it might be like and you can expect some loss and you can expect a lot of little balls <laughs> so and if you frog something that was even older I can imagine you might lose even more due to broken plies so um, I did want to I did want to mention that so moving on to works in progress I have cast on a new pair of socks which are here oh in this super cute bag I got this bag at work how cute is that I think I'll just be happy today I'd seen it for in the shop for a couple weeks and every time I walked by it I just made me smile because it, it's something that I tell myself a lot um, especially when like things trip up your day and you're like no I'm not gonna focus on the negativity I think I'll just be happy today <laughs> so um, yeah I love it and I love the I love the little tassel pom-pom on the zipper as well so I love this but my socks are in here and I'm using the trekking XXL that I showed on the last episode very dark colors Wow I really like where I set my light because this is perfect so I cast on on the toe using the trekking sport in 1460 and now I'm knitting the body in trekking XXL 661 this variegated gray and I'm finding that this is a very loose gauge. I think this yarn might even be finer than the last one because if I get up close, which it starts to blow the color out a little bit, but can you see that when I stretch it? Do you know what that means? That means if I continue knitting socks with this yarn, I have to go down to double zeros, at least maybe triple zeros. So I've decided after these socks, I will eventually be knitting another pair of Trekking XXL, XXL socks with double zeros. I think it's just a really thin sock yarn uh, because the Super Sparkle socks that I knit Emily see even when I stretch it, it's still pretty intact and you want a tight gauge on your socks. So. I think it's just a really loose sock yarn and I'm gonna have to go down which is kind of a bummer but it is what it is so yeah right now these are US zeros I'm gonna keep going I'm gonna knit them at this gauge if nothing else for experiment to see at this loose of a gauge how will they wear are they comfortable um, 
you know, I really like learning through experience. So, yeah, I'm only a couple rows past the toe on these. I just cast on 12 stitches on each needle, increased up to, oh, I didn't tell you guys. These are actually less stitches than usual. So the last pair of socks I did was a 60 stitch sock, which was too big. I was thinking about dropping to 56 stitches, but instead I dropped down to 52. I decided that after reading Jane Richmond's uh, tube socks pattern where she recommends um, one to one and a half inches of negative ease on a sock, I decided, well, dropping down four stitches is only going to be just a little bit. So what, half inch, I think, for my gauge. So I decided to go, drop down eight stitches, which is would be a whole inch, which um, I'd have to check my gauge again with this yarn, but uh, with this specific colorway, which seems to be thinner than the last one. Um, and I think it might have to do something with the, the way it's plied. But um, yeah. I have to check my gauge, but I think it's going to be almost a one inch of negative ease. But I've tried them on, and they fit way better in width than the last pair. So we're, I'm at least making the right kind of progress. I'm at least getting closer and closer to a better fit with this yarn. So I also started a second spinning project. I had this scan a hand spun in stash. I spun it I think a little over two years ago. Um, show you up close. It's a chain plied DK weight yarn and this was fiber from Penguin Soup. Um, she started dyeing fiber not too long before she closed shop and what I really like about when she started dyeing fiber is she sent these tags. She doesn't send these tags with her yarn but this was attached to her braid of fiber and it's got, it's really thick and it's got a sticker on the back that tells you the colorway name and then it also, is it not going to focus? It tells you the colorway name and then it also has a space for all of the details and the, um, as well as what the fiber is. I'm so used to creating my own tags that it's nice that she gives you a tag that has her name on it. So you have less to write really. Um, there is just one tag and unfortunately I always have to spin two skeins because of the size of my bobbins. But I thought this was nice and I uh, had this attached to the spinning fiber. So I had in the past, over two years ago, made it its own tag and then had planned to tie both together and put the total yardage on this one. So, yeah, but I never got around to spinning it. You know, when I moved, my craft room was in storage for almost two years. So it sat and sat and sat, and I don't remember why, after spinning the, um, the white in silk, that I just was like, oh yeah, this fiber's up there and I have this done, I should just finish it. So I grabbed it. And I have done my best, I've done my best to attempt to spin it the same weight so that this, ooh, that white balanced funky, uh, so that this will chain ply to be this weight. And you know, I don't know how accurate it's going to be because in some places it looks like it's going to be really good, in some places it looks like it's going to be too thick. So my guess is that it's going to be close, but on average just a little bit thicker. So we'll see. I tried to use this as a gauge and as I was spinning I would try to overlap the single on top of these plies and pretend it was like being plied next to it to see if it was relatively the same thickness. Um, so we'll see but I did get all the single spun. I just finished that this morning and I'm gonna be chain plying or Navajo plying it up soon and um, then I'll start spinning for uh, the So Perfect Pearls um, Year of the mini skeins, where you spin mini skeins and you challenge yourself to something new. So I've got plans for um, an opposing three ply. I've got plans for spinning new breeds. I've also got plans to try a different setup on my wheel. My wheel can do double drive or scotch tension. I think it can even do Irish tension too. But I've always only spun it using double drive. So I want to try spinning with a different setup and like challenge myself to figure it out. I fundamentally know how it is, it works, 
and I don't remember which is which, the Scotch and the Irish tension, one is bobbin lead, one is flyer lead. Uh, Double Drive uses both. So um, I want to challenge myself to learn that setup on my wheel and uh, kind of just see what happens. So that will be coming down the road. Um, there is a spin-in at work on Saturday, so I think I'm going to go and see if uh, I can chat with some people about it and they can help me figure it out too. Uh, but of course there's always YouTube. YouTube and um, I think it was in my owner's manual as well. So yes, more spinning. Um, so oh, I cast on a cardigan and this is all, so I only know her Instagram name. It's like KCAC podcast on Instagram. She's got a podcast, but I think it's an audio only podcast, but um, I may be wrong. But I follow her on Instagram and she's knitting a Maxfield cardigan. And I not only had that cardigan in my queue, I had a sweaters quantity that I purchased for that cardigan about a year, maybe two years ago. And so seeing her progress finally pushed me over to be like, you know what, I'm casting it on. I'm casting it on. I, w I want one. So I did. And what's cool about this pattern is you start with your sleeves. I hate knitting sleeves, but when the sleeves are first, I'm excited because that's the, you know, the exciting stage is the cast on. So I am, I don't want to say a bad knitter. Like that's the first thing that came to mind. I was like, I'm a bad knitter because I didn't swatch. I'm not a bad knitter, but I didn't swatch. <laughs> uh, I didn't swatch, I just cast on with the recommended smaller needle, which was US3, knit my cuff, and I'm alternating skeins. Um, this is the dark color. It's Dream and Color Everlasting DK in the Galaxy colorway, and my three skeins are all completely different, even though they're the same dye lot, because it's an indie dyed yarn. Then my uh, second, my contrasting color, is the same base, but it's on uh, the dream on colorway. And I think this colorway might actually be specific to Eat Sleep Knit. I, I don't know. Eat Sleep Knit does a lot of exclusive colorways with a lot of popular dyers. So um, when I put this on my page on Ravelry, it, the colorway didn't show up, which usually means it's either new or exclusive and not there's not that many out there, so it hasn't been used a lot. So. Because I know I bought this at least almost two years ago, I don't think it's new enough to say new. I think it may be exclusive. But also that could be wrong. But the Maxfield cardigan, let me show you. Now that I have a printer, I got a printer for Christmas. Um, I can print all my patterns. This is the Maxfield cardigan. It is a nice open cardigan with a pretty wide flappy front. I am very excited about that. I have a black cardigan that's the style that I wear all of the time. So uh, I think I will wear this one a lot. I like stripes. I like chevrons. And you can tell by the original photo that I was inspired by her color choices because I went with the purple. And I think this is a great pattern to show off variegated because those that lighter striping, that dream on color, is a variegated yarn. And I think it's just... It's a nice pop. So, downside. Look how big my magic loop needles are. I really should get a smaller cord for knitting this. Um, we, we sell the flexi, flexi flips at work, the Addy Flexi Flips. I've tested them. I love them. I want them for this sleeve, but we sell out as soon as they come in, so we don't have them in stock. Uh, so, I wish I had them, but I, I don't have them yet. Um, but yeah, I'm just using my Knit Picks interchangeable set for now. Oh, so the body. This body was recommended to knit on US size 5, and I just thought DK US 5 for my usual gauge seemed a little loose, so I am actually knitting the body on US 4s, and I measured gauge, and I'm meeting gauge. I'm meeting gauge without having swatched. But that's pre-blocked, um, and so I'm hoping. I didn't check, but I'm hoping the gauge was pre-blocked. Uh, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. I've heard mixed um, opinions on whether a pattern should have pre-blocked a gauge or post-blocked gauge. You knit it pre-blocked, so <laughs> um, I think it's helpful to know both. If your yarn's going to stretch after blocking, it's helpful to know how much, so you know when to stop or when to keep going. Anyways, 
I have just a partial sleeve. I think um, there's going to be six of these sets of three contrasting colored stripes before I get to the top and then knit my other sleeve and then it should be smooth sailing after that. Um, I did get feedback that there's a lot of seaming in this garment but that's okay. That means structure and I'm okay with that. The one thing that's weird though I was also going to mention, I don't know if you can tell, do you kind of see how it puckers because of the chevron stitch? I think when it's worn and I think after it's blocked I think that puckering will go away, but for now, and maybe it's because I'm knitting it magic loop, sorry about the needles clicking, um, it kind of like does this weird chevroning down the edge. I don't know how well you can see that because my background is so, um, it's not cluttered, but it's busy. My background is so busy. But yeah, I'm very excited about this cardigan. Uh, it's, it's a weird mix of attention but mindless because it's got you know you've got like a good number of rows in between those chevron stripes where you just knit so you know knitting 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 okay now I have to pay attention for a little bit and then knitting 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 oh, I have to pay attention for a little bit so I can I can knit it while watching the kids and so um, I don't think it's gonna go to the wayside like some other more complicated projects have all right so that's all I have for works in progress. Moving on to design time. I have been working on my design for the March Crochet Along Together with Scassell. I am using Haiku Woody, which is like a raffia yarn, and I've been recording the process so that I can put out a video on the whole process of designing it separate from the podcast. And um, I had to frog my progress. I started, I, I swatched, then I started, and my shape just didn't turn out the way I wanted it to. And so I had to frog it and re I will be restarting today. <laughs> so um, I'm doing that. But then also, I don't know if you remember, but Kat sent me yarn. And I was very inspired to design something out of the Great Pumpkin. I'm just using, do you, remember I got, do you guys remember I made this bag? I've decided to keep it. <laughs> I took it to the craft fair, tried to sell it, nobody wanted it, so now I'm keeping it. But I've started a tank top for myself out of the Great pump Pumpkin. So this yarn was dyed by Cat Straight, and um, this was inspired by Charlie Brown, and this is on her Merino Silk Nylon base. I, I Oh, the tag is like, I shoved the tag in there when I wound it, so I don't want to dig it out and have yarn barf. But I've decided to crochet myself a tank top with it because I think I can squeeze out a tank top with one skein of yarn. Um, I've decided to make sure I have enough yarn to start from the top. That way, if I start running out, when I get closer to the bottom, I can switch to a lace pattern, which will take less yarn. Um, and so that's the mindset. So starting at the, the, the top of a tank top, I wanted it to be as seamless as possible. I want just a basic tank with a v-neck that will have some lace around the v-neck and some lace at the bottom. So I've decided to start with a strap and I'm actually starting with the strap back here. So where the strap's going to hit at my shoulder blade is where I started and I'm just crocheting back and forth the width until I get to where I want the, the tank top to start and then I'm going to start increasing in on this side to shape that V. And I'm going to keep it straight here because I'm going to eventually add extra stitches under the arm. So I'm going to stay straight here, increase here for the V-neck until I hit about, not bust, but like kind of the lowest part of a neckline. So like until I get here. And so then I'll stop and make a second one. Then I'm going to join them create stitches for the underarm and the back and when I go across the back I'm going to join the other side of the straps so that then I'm in the round and I can just go down until I'm ready to start the lace and then when I'm done with the lace I'm going to come back up and add more lace here I don't think I'm going to add any in the back we'll see but so that's the plan so I'm using a 2.0 no 2.5 millimeter crochet hook to crochet this and for the straps I have decided on single crochet because I want them to be sturdy and dense which is single crochet is a great choice for that but surprisingly so because I'm working back and forth it curls 
but it's wool and silk, so it will block out. But watch this. What? What? I've never seen single crochet do this. Although I don't know that I've ever single crocheted a small strip like this. Definitely not in this weight. But this surprised the heck out of me. I feel like there's so much opportunity. This is like elastic. Well, not it's not as stretchy as elastic, but this is, I have never seen crochet be this stretchy before. Um, with the bounce back, like, there's bounce back. This is amazing. So <laughs> I'm very, very surprised. I mean, not what you want in a strap, uh, but I don't think it's gonna hurt anything. Um, but yeah, very. I was very surprised about that. Um, but so far, mindless. And the body, I'm gonna do linked double crochet. So that should be pretty mindless too. I know once I attach everything and I'm just going bust down, it's gonna be boring. But that's what I need. I need simple, mindless, boring projects that I can do while being a stay-at-home mom. So I think this is going to be perfect. And so I love, I love this base. This is an amazing base. I've, I don't think I've bought um, a merino silk base from an indie dyer before. But this is, this is a really nice base. It's very, very soft. It's working up very, very nice. And the, the dye job. I mean, there's no flashing, there's no pooling, it's just a beautiful, multicolored, kind of speckled uh, coloring. So, Kat, I love it. Um, so that takes me to check it out. Kat's opened her shop, you guys. And actually, I forgot to grab the yarn again because I was going to re-show it to you, so hold on. Okay, so Kat's opened her shop on Etsy, and it's called Cat's, no, not Cat's, Cat Tails yarn. So you can go to etsy.com slash shop slash cattails yarn to get to her store. Sometimes when stores are newer, I find that it's harder to get to them through searching. So um, if you can type in the direct link or go to Kat's Facebook page, she's Kat Straight on Instagram. I said Facebook page, I meant Instagram. If you go to her Instagram page, um, her name is Kat Straight on Instagram and there will be a link in her bio to her Etsy shop. And um, she's got a good handful of yarn in the shop and a lot of the colorways I actually have. Um, I do know she sold out of this one, so that one's not in the shop. But she's got some more of the Wheel of Time. She's got some Wheel of Time in there, this Moraine Sedai. And she's got um, the Yellow Aja. And then she's got a bunch of Charlie Brown. So she has the Great Pumpkin, which is what my tank top is out of. And then she's got Christmas Time is here, which I have this one, but it's not quite the same as the ones in the shop because this was experimental on her way to the colorway she was working on. So um, if you liked any of the colors that you've seen, um, definitely go check them out in her shop. They're up there. And if not, it doesn't hurt to check out her shop and just favorite it <laughs> so that you can see new yarns as she puts them up. She also has a podcast that she's been put putting videos up on more recently on YouTube. So I'll link everything down below, but I did want to mention um, that her shop is now open. It actually opened last week and I forgot to mention it in the podcast. And then I felt horrible. I was like, oh man, I forgot to mention it. So Cat's shop is open. Check it out. Links below. Um, current events. So the Faith Love Crafts and Mandelbrot Crafts cra 2018 Craft Along collab is going on right now and the threads are open in both my group and Amber's group. So if you are going, <laughs> if you plan on participating, head on over to the threads to check out the rules and details and um, I'm still working on prizes, so I don't have those all set yet. Oh, and I forgot to say that was going... <laughs> you guys, I feel like I can't talk right now. I'm collabing with Amber on this 2018 Craft-a-thon until the end of February. So everyone who posts finished objects before the end of February will be entered into the prize drawings. Okay, moving on to let's chat. 
I went to the spinning guild, the local spinning guild on Tuesday and it was so much fun. It was so amazing. I'm sharing my experience and I feel a little guilty because I was, I used to be in a place in Georgia that there were, there was not a local spinning guild to join. And so I feel kind of rude gloating about how awesome joining a spinning guild is when I know that there's some of you watching that don't have that opportunity. So I feel guilty about that. I feel bad for that. But also, um, for those of you who spin and have local spinning guilds and have yet to try to join or visit or check it out, um, hopefully this will encourage you to do so. I had such an amazing time. There were so many amazing people there and they were so accepting. Um, I showed up and I was like, is this this is this the guild and they're like yeah welcome how'd you find us oh come here and I we talked yarns and spinning and wheels and the meeting they had show and tell and these people are so knowledgeable and talented and it was just amazing I'm gonna learn so much just from meeting these other women that have you know years more experience than me and then there's also women who just started and know almost absolutely nothing so it was cool to see the range of experience and just the openness and to be a part of a community I was telling my husband that I have never been openly accepted into a group before ever ever um i was always the outcast and weird the weird goth girl you know and uh and i used to be very socially awkward and have social anxiety really bad i've since overcome a lot of that i'm still weird but <laughs> i look a lot more socially acceptable and um but even even so if if me 10 years ago knew how to spin and I went to this group they would accept me with open arms these are just amazing people and it was it was just so cool it was really it was really cool I was like riding a social high for at least a couple days afterwards because um, like I said it's just it's something unlike I've ever experienced before and it was really really cool and I, I I'm gonna make sure to go they only meet once a month I'm gonna make sure to go to every meeting it's only for a couple hours one day a month there's no reason I should miss out on the so adult social time around what I'm passionate about. Um, I mean, I think we as humans just need something like that in our life. Um, it's the it's I don't need as much social time as other people, but if I'm going to need some, that's the kind of time I want. <laughs> so that was really really cool. And then, um, so what else did I write down? Oh, I got fiber at the guild meeting. So January's meeting, they called it the rock meeting, and they had some people show up who were vendors, so indie dyers, and they also had some of the guild members bring in stuff that they sell and that they hand make, and then also people were kind of like de-stashing too. So um, I had no idea. <laughs> I found them on Ravelry, but there wasn't a bunch of information there. Um, all the information's in the newsletter, which I'm now signed up for. But um, I did end up buying some fiber from Edgewood Garden Studios, who is local to me, and I love them. Um, well, I didn't take it out of the plastic, so there's going to be some crinkling. But I got this beautiful braid. I'm trying to get the glare off. I got this beautiful braid of tease water. I've never spun tease water before. And this is in the Trading Post colorway. So I'm very excited to get my hands on some of that. And then I also bought a bat. I bought this. They sent it home in a bag because it was raining. But I bought this beautiful, beautiful blended purple and blue merino bat. And it's so soft. It's so soft. It's only two ounces, so I think this is going to be used for um, one of the mini skeins um, that I will be spinning. I think I'm going to, oh, I didn't mention that when I talked about the spin, the mini skein of the year long. I said what it was already. My brain is like slowly not working. I need to wrap this up soon. Uh, <laughs> um, I think I'm going to spin this over the fold. I've never done that before. I know it's a way that you can spin a worsted prep to get a more woolen yarn, but what about spinning a woolen prep over the fold? Do you get a double woolen yarn? Do you know the answer to that? I don't. I'm going to try it. So, or at least I think that's what I'm going to do. So, mm. I'm so fluffy. I love it. 
Now I have fiber up my nose. That's my nose ring catching. I got my lipstick too. <sighs> oh, so two more things. I got head butted by my daughter. <laughs> so she had the fridge open. She was pointing to something in the back asking me for it. So I leaned over the top of her to reach it. And when I got my hands on it, she got excited and she jumped. And the top of her head hit me right in the eye. So yeah, I got hit in the eye and it hit the top, like my eyebrow and then also my cheekbone, but then also my eye. And getting hurt, hit here and here, bruised and hurt, but not nearly as bad as actually getting hit in the eye. Um, it wasn't as near as much of an impact, but it hurt so much more. And it hurt so bad I started crying and it freaked Emily out because she was like, oh, I hurt mom. And so she started bawling and it sucked. I don't know if you can see, but I still have a little bit of a black eye. I have makeup on, so it might uh, not show, but I have just like the slightest bit of bruising left. I don't have any on my eyebrow. Um, it's just a, a tad tender to the touch, but yeah, that hurt. <laughs> Um, and then I actually went for a run this week, so it's been really, really cold here, and out of nowhere there was a day where it was not so cold and it was not raining, so I decided to go for a jog, and running is my preferred method of exercise, and you know, after the holidays and eating so bad, I feel guilty. <laughs> so, And I also just know I haven't exercised in a long time, and it used to be something I did multiple times a week, and um... I used to be in really good shape. So uh, I'd like to get back in really good shape and I'd like to do that um, by running and a little bit of muscle training, uh, a little bit of weight training. But yeah, so I went for a run. I ran, what? I ran two miles in, no, I ran a mile and a half in 15 minutes. Or was it six? It was 15 or 16 minutes which is really, really slow. I used to run a mile and a half, um, on average, I would say in 12 minutes, but I think my record was like 1130. So, um, yeah, very, very slow, but I did surprise myself. I actually was able to run jog the whole mile and a half without stopping, which wasn't too bad. I didn't think I was going to be able to, to, to do that. Um, uh, so I think I'm just going to keep running and, slowly get back in shape and eventually push myself back out to three miles per run. That's what I used to run when I was right after I had my son. I would just run three miles five days a week and um, I was in really good shape. I felt really good. I slept better and I missed that. I miss that feeling. So um, I will be, I will be doing a little bit more running, um, which so now I think I want to get a Fitbit. Um, I was talking to somebody about Fitbits and um, they were talking about the sleep cycle, how it can track your sleep cycle. And I thought that was really, really cool. And um, I would like, I would be interested in tracking my exercise as well as my sleep cycle. So I think I may eventually be getting a Fitbit down the road. Do you own a Fitbit? Do you like it? Do you have recommendations? Do you hate it? Did you have one and get rid of it? Let me know. Um, I'm curious for the feedback. I'm not going to be rushing into this anytime soon. Um, I have a very, very strict budget this year. So um, it's it was against the budget to buy fiber at the Guild, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> I know you all know what that's like. But um, so yeah, I mean, it's something that would be pretty far down the road, but it's something I've been considering. So um, that's all I have for you guys this week. So until next time, happy crafting. Bye.